Okay, so let's get started. So the really the teaching objective here is to introduce you uh, a technique called Monte Carlo integration. Uh, it's by no means um, only used for biomedical applications, but it is kind of the gold standard to solve a lot of problems, um, even in biomedicine. Uh, so we'll see how Monte Carlo works in general first, and then I will introduce the stochastic model of light transport in tissue. Um, hopefully you already heard some of it uh, in pre uh, previous lectures. And finally, we'll see how the Monte Carlo integration framework can be applied to solve the kind of problems that we are interested in. Um, so the outline of uh, this lecture basically follows this philosophy. Uh, we start with Monte Carlo integration. I will show you some, say, toy examples. That's not really biomedical examples, but hopefully these can motivate uh, the usefulness of Monte Carlo. And then we'll talk about radi radiative transfer, that is kind of a physical model governing light propagation in translucent materials, including human tissue. And finally, we'll basically do one plus two. So there is going to be some math ahead, uh, but don't panic. If you don't get the details, that's fine, because as long as you understand the principles, I think uh, that's already good enough. And also, if you want to revisit some of the mathematical details, the slides should be uh, available after this lecture, so you can go back and look at the mathematical details. Okay, so let's get started on Monte Carlo integration. So why Monte Carlo? Uh, as I just mentioned, uh, it's a very powerful tool uh, for numerically estimating complex integrals, and that's exactly what we will need um, in our problems. Uh, and as a result, it's also the so-called gold standard uh, to simulate that light transport in tissue. Monte Carlo offers a few advantages. For example, it provides estimates with quantifiable uncertainty, which basically means uh, although we know the, uh, the results coming from this approach is, all, is only an approximation, but we know how inaccurate that is, and we can make it arbitrarily accurate as long as, well, we spend enough time to do the uh, enough computation, basically. Uh, it, it's also adaptable to systems with very complex geometries. It's very general. It doesn't have any assumption on, for example, the shape of the tissue or anything like that. It's, in principle, it can solve, say, any problem. OK. So now, um, let's start to look at how it works. So as I just mentioned, our goal is to evaluate some sort of numerically evaluate some sort of integral. So here we have, say, a potentially high dimensional function, f of x. Um, notice here, whenever uh, I have a, a, a bold symbol, that basically means a vector. So here, f of x means x could potentially be a vector in a high dimensional space. f here is not in bold, which basically means the function itself is scalar value. It takes a vector as input, and it returns a, a single number. And gamma is basically the space for that integral. So Monte Carlo integration will be numerical. It's not, it will not give you an analytical solution to this integral. Um, and also, it's non-deterministic, which basically means there is randomness involved. If you run this say, little program multiple times, it will give you slightly different answers. And the third feature is that it's scalable to high-dimensional problems of here. Basically, this method doesn't care how the, that doesn't care the dimensionality of gamma. It can be a light, can be a volume. Either is fine. The, the um, this method doesn't lose performance uh, based on this dimensionalities. So before diving into the details, uh, let me go over a few uh, concept, the basic concepts on random variables because well, we have randomness. So you have to know how random, random variables work and how the, their expected values work. Uh, so random variables, we normally see random variables in two categories. There are discrete random variables, which basically means they have a, uh, well, normally a finite number or accountably infinite uh, possible outcomes. So in this case, if we look at a finite outcome case, there are basically, say, n outcomes. 
from x1 to xn. And to describe the distribution, we normally use their probability masses. So from P1 to Pn, that tells us, well, the probability for each outcome to occur. Uh, a very simple example here is a fair coin. We all, uh, we all know if we flip a coin, uh, if it's a fair coin, then we have a 50% probability to get a head and another 50% to get a tail. Which basically means there are two possible outcomes and the probability for each of them is just one half. And there's another type uh, of random variables, which we normally call continuous random variables. So instead of just taking uh, 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 one of the say one of n possible outcomes, in this case the outcomes come from say a continuous set or a subset. Here we again use gamma, which can be again high dimensional. And in this case, uh, to describe the distribution of a random variable like this, we use so-called probability density functions. So it's kind of similar to the mass, the probability masses, but instead of adding everything up to one, we now compute an integral. So the density function should integrate to one. Okay. So based on these definitions, um, there's a very say, important uh, property here, which is called strong law of large numbers. That's also what allowed Monte Carlo methods to work. So why is Monte Carlo methods correct? Uh, this is basically why. So let's say we have some random variable x. We don't know the, let's say even we don't know the distribution, but we can make independent observations. So we can say, take a value of x multiple times because it's random, so every time it's gonna give us something different. However, the, this strong law of large numbers state that if we take many, many samples, n samples when n being very large. And then we evaluate the sample mean. So basically we add up all the observations and compute their average. The sample mean will converge to the real expected value when n is very big. So this is basically um, what we will do for Monte Carlo because as long as we can generate many, many samples, we know that their average will converge to what we eventually need. So before looking at real integrals, let me show you a simple uh, poor example, which is to evaluate pi. Um, sometimes we can, people interpret this as, say, throwing a dart. Uh, so this is how it works. As, assume that you have a unit circle, which is the orange one, S, and within a square. In this case, the square has edge length 2 because the circle has a radius one, right? Now, let's say we throw a dart at this square, then the probability for the dart, or the point, to be inside the circle is just the ratio between the area of the circle and the square, right? Because we assume the, 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 dot, the dart uh, is a, a position, say, uniformly at random. So we know the circle area is just pi, which is radius one, and the square has area four, it's two times two is four, right? So based on this observation, let's define a function of x. x, again, is a position within the square. We just uh, define the, this function to be four if x is inside and zero if it's outside. Now if we look at the expected value of this function, there are two possible outcomes. It's either four or zero, right? And the probability for it to get four, well, it's pi over four. So we know that the expected, uh, the expected value of this function f should be just pi. Okay, so based on this observation, there is a very simple solution for computing pi numerically. We just need to generate n samples x1 through xn. Note that here, each x is a 2D vector, it's a position inside the square, it's x, this x and y axis of uh, coordinates. And then based on each position, we can just check whether it's inside the circle or not, and then compute the sample. Okay. So let me show you a live demo. Here is a super short piece of code. 
something like this. Now, it's fine if you don't, if you are not familiar with Python or NumPy. So the, what we did here is we, well, we need a lot of samples. Here, let's say we use uh, we start with fewer samples. We start with a million samples, ten to the power of six, and then we generate this many x positions. So it's every x is between minus one to one. We assume the circle is centered at the origin. R is the distance from the point to the center. So we know if the distance is less than one, y should be four. Otherwise, y should be zero. And then we just evaluate the sample mean. So that's just um, implementing what we just saw. If we execute it, We get 3.143, so somewhere around well, the pi value that we all know. But there will be randomness, let's see. So sometimes it gives you 3.141, 3.140, but it's around the right value. If we increase the number of samples, this time the whole thing will run slower. But it will give us more reliable results. So one for one, one for two. Okay. So we are basically just doing um, what I showed here: generate a bunch of positions and then evaluate sample mean. So here is what happens if we. Uh, here's how sample mean changes with, well, the number of samples. As I mentioned, uh, the more samples we have, the more accurate uh, the sample mean will be. Here, uh, in the left plot, the horizontal dashed orange line is the real pi value. We can see that uh, by increasing the number of samples, the mean kind of converges to that the ground truth value. And on the, on the right-hand side, I actually show the relative error. We can see that the error drops. Uh, there's some randomness, but it follows a certain curve. And we'll see what that curve is later. And on the bottom, I basically showed how the samples look like. If we just have a thousand samples, then the, the green ones are those we see in the circle, and the orange ones are, that, are those that are outside. If we increase the amount of samples, we get better and better estimation of pi. Let me know if you have any questions. Feel free to ask ask, ask questions if you have any. Okay. So next, next, let's look at integrals. Here we have we have seen how to do pi, but that's not our main interest. So for integral, uh, as a very quick uh, review, we have one-dimensional integral, which basically gives us uh, the area below some curve given by a function f. There are high-dimensional high integrals. In the two-dimensional case, for example, f gives kind of a surface, and the, the integral basically corresponds to the volume below that surface. Um, some, of, some of you might have seen um, more standard numerical techniques to evaluate integrals. Uh, sometimes we call this quadrature rule. The idea is just if we uh, subdivide uh, the domain of integral into many small bins, and then in each bin we just take the function value, a single function value, and then you evaluate the volume or the area in that bin, and then we add everything up. So in this case it's 1D, so we subdivide the say minus 2 to 2 into a number of little intervals, and then in each interval we basically evaluate uh, the area of a rectangle, and we add up the, all these areas. Um, this is, uh, the quadrature method is, works very well in one, for one-dimensional problems. It actually converges faster than Monte Carlo in 1D. However, there are some problems, uh, with the main one being that um, it scales poorly with dimensionality. If we have, say, two dimensions, we have to subdivide each dimension into, say, n beams, then we get n squared beams. If we have m dimensions, we need 
n to the power of m beans. So this grows very quickly with the number of dimensions. Unfortunately, as you will see later, we will have a high dimensional integral. So this type of approach is not very good uh, for solving our problems. So finally, uh, we can start to talk about how Monte Carlo integration works. So here, just as a reminder, uh, our goal is to estimate some integral uh, i. And the idea really is to construct some random variable, which here we normally denote as this uh, bra uh, bracket i, and such that the expected value of this random variable should be the real answer that we want. And that's the trick. So in this, in this case, uh, this random variable is called an unbiased estimator. It estimates the real, uh, in, uh, the real i. But the question is how? The main idea here actually is surprisingly simple. So let's assume we have some probability density p. In theory, it can be anything, but in practice, there are some um, there are some desired uh, properties we'll see later. And let's for now assume p is just some arbitrary probability density over the domain of integral gamma. And x be a random variable with that density p. Okay. Now we just need to define i as f over p. And then if we look at the expected value of this random variable, we'll see that well i is by definition f over p, however, the, def the definition of um, expected value tells us, as you can see uh, on the right hand, uh, on the upper right, the little equation there, that's kind of the definition of expected value. G is any function, so the expected value of g of x is gx times px integral, integrated. But in this case, g is simply f over p, so the, the two p's cancel out. So in the end, we basically got the integration of just f, which is exactly what we need. So that is how we get a random variable that can uh, actually help us to evaluate complex integrals. So finally, of course, we need to e estimate the expected value of this random variable, but as we have already seen in the pi example, we just do this, do this based on the strong law of large numbers, we generate many, many observations of this random variable, and then we evaluate, we compute their, the sample mean. And we know that sample mean will convert to uh, i, what it, what is the, uh, which is the answer of that integral. Okay. So here is how uh, it works. As I just mentioned, first we need to pick a probability density function p. Um, in theory, this this can be anything, um, but in practice, better a, a better density will give us a faster convergence, and that's important in practice. And after pick choosing this uh, probability density, then we just need to generate n independent samples from it, and then we evaluate this f over p for each sample. And then we return a sample mean. Okay. And you might wonder how to actually generate independent observations of some arbitrary probability density. Um, fortunately, this there exists a number of methods that can do it. Um, so today I will just show you one of the more uh, basic method. So here we have a universal method for generating independent samples from almost arbitrary uh, one-dimensional PDFs. So for higher, sometimes higher dimensional uh, densities can be sampled using the multiple steps of this. Um, but for now, let's just look at the one-dimensional case. So given a one-dimensional um, probability distribution function, little f, um, that its cumulative density function, or CDF, is basically given by this uh, uppercase f which gives the probability for the random variable to take a value that's smaller than a. So we can see it's basically an integrated version of little f. So these two functions can both 
um, unique, uniquely define a distribution. So they sometimes they are used interchangeably. Uh, so here we assume we have this uh, cumulative density function. After getting this, then what we need to do is to first sample a random variable uniformly between 0 and 1. And this is normally very easy to do because in almost all programming languages, you can use a function like rand or, or something similar to give you, that, that basically gives you a C here. And after getting this uniform 0, 1 number, we just need to say solve, can basically solve an equation such that f of x equals C, or equivalently x equals the inverse of the CDF function. So if you look at the, uh, the plot here, we have a CDF. Remember that the CDF is a function that goes from 0 to 1 because it's a cumulated uh, probability. So what we do is we first uniformly sample a, sample a value uh, across the y-axis. So we get this C first. And then we look at what x actually gives this value. So what f of x that equals this random 0, 1 value. So, so, this, so we start with the y coordinate and then we look for x. So that's a common way uh, people draw samples from non-uniform distribution. Okay. So we have seen how to generate samples from a distribution, but the bigger question really is how to pick the density function p in the first place. Uh, well, although in theory p can be almost anything, uh, but in practice, in practice, first, uh, uniform distributions all, almost always work. If you don't know what distribution to use, uh, uniform distribution is generally a good start. Um, well, as long as the domain is bounded or the domain is finite. If you have an infinite domain, uniform will work. Um, however, the choice of this density function greatly affects the effectiveness of the resulting estimator. So. Um, in, in practical applications, uh, people will need to choose these density functions very carefully, uh, as we will see uh, in our later examples for light transporting tissue. Okay. So, uh, as a, a wrapping up example, let's look at a Monte Carlo integration hello world example. Uh, so now let's assume we want to evaluate this simple 1D integral, which is integral between 0 and 1, and the integrand is basically 5 times x to the power of 4. And actually, we don't really need Monte Carlo for this, since we know the answer. The empty derivative of the integrand is basically x to the power of, power of 5. So we evaluate the, uh, the difference between x to the power of 5 between 0 and 1, and that gives us 1. So we know I sh the, the real answer for I is just 1. Uh, but for now, let's pretend we don't know the answer. And let's see how Monte Carlo works for it. Um, again, we need to pick a, dis uh, a probability density first. So for now, let's just pick that density as, well, uniform 0, 1. Since the, uh, the domain of integration happens to be 0 to 1, so we just conveniently pick the um, probability density P as the uniform distribution between 0 and 1. So in this case, um, the density function P is basically 1 always, because it's 1 over 1, so it goes away. So this Monte Carlo integration, uh, F over P, just becomes F itself, where F is the integrand, is 5 times x to the power of 4. So finally, we just need to generate a number of x's. This times x are all just numbers. And then we do have F over P, evaluate the sample mean. Okay, so now again, let me show you how uh, how this how this thing works. This is even simpler than the previous high example. So here again, we generate n random axes. So here, random is, gives us uniform zero one variables already, so we don't have to do anything else. Then y is basically 5 times x to the power of 4. And then, well, well, well we do sample. 
So, again, if I run it, you can see 0.997 sums really close to 1. 1, 1, 1, something like that. As you can imagine, again, we can increase the number of samples to get more reliable more reliable answers one more, always okay. so I've already seen that so here again is a plot for that again on, on the right plot shows um, the sample mean, how sample mean converges to the real answer, which is one. Uh, and on the right hand side, we sh I showed the um, relative error again. As we can see, this error kind of follows a curve, and we'll see what that curve is soon. And on the bottom, I just showed the histogram of the sample distributions, so how the um, how individual samples take their value. As we can see, the more samples we take, the their distributions, um, the more accurately their distributions follow kind of the real distribution. Okay. Any question? Good. So now let's uh, take a quick look at how this, this thing converges. Since we already seen, this is the simple framework for Monte Carlo integration. So everything boils down to basically f over p, where, at, where well, uh, where f is the integrand and p is some density function. Um, however, we, we still want to know how fast does this algorithm converge. So this comes down to a theorem, which a very important theorem uh, in statistics, which people call central limit theorem. So what this theorem, the theorem states is that let x1, x2, etc. be a sequence of, well, independently uh, distributed random uh, variables with this, well identically in, independently and identically distributed random variables well with the same mean which is new and some variance let's assume the variance is finite and then this theorem states that if we look at the sample mean sn basically means the average of the first n observation no matter what uh, the original distribution for x is as long as we we take a very large n, the distribution of s of n kind of converges to a normal distribution. This is what central limit theorem states. Uh, this is a very nice property um, because if we translate this language into our context, um, it allows us to evaluate. Um, Kind of, kind of, it allows us to quantitatively um, e evaluate the confidence of our estimations. So basically, we can do something like this. Um, here, I, again, just remind you, we have an estimator um, bracketed I um, for to to, uh, to estimate some integral I. So here we have. Um, a probability for i, which is the real value, to be within Sn. Again, Sn is just a sample mean. We know the sample mean eventually converges to i. But well, this one can tell us what is the probability for the real i to be within a certain distance to the sample mean. So here we can see Sn is converging to i, phi. And then um, Sigma is some unknown variance. We assume it's finite. And then when n goes larger, we can see that sigma doesn't change, but sigma over square root of n decreases. So very often we call this interval a confidence interval. Here, in this particular case, I showed a 99% confidence interval. It basically means there's a 99% chance for the real answer to fall within this interval. And we can get this interval from our numerical simulation. And of course, we can, uh, as you might have, uh, as you can imagine, here the 99% is associated with the constant 2.576 here. 
if you want the confidence to be even higher, you'll need to increase that constant 2.576 here. And that constant, which is normally called the critical value. Okay. So for here, we just use the 99% example. Since we have seen that the size of the confidence interval can shrink at the rate of square root of n, this basically tells us, in general, Monte Carlo methods have a, uh, have a convergence rate of 1 over square root of n. And these are precisely what we have seen earlier in the error image. So the orange dashed line that I put up in this error images, uh, in error plus, are actually just the 1 over square root of n curve. So you can see the, um, the relative error in both cases, in both the pi case and the uh, def, uh, and the other, the integral case, they all kind of follow this one over square root of n curve. Okay, any questions? Okay, good. Okay, so next let's, so this is it for the general Monte Carlo case. Hopefully you, uh, you get the basic idea. Really the basic idea is f over p. Not, not too much more than that. And you'll see how f over p helps us to simulate light transport in tissue. So now let's talk, uh, start to look at the physical model that, uh, that describes how light propagates in translucent materials, including human tissue. So it's called radiative transfer. Uh, so here's a quick recap. So in the early lectures, uh, we learned that radiance uh, is the central quantity of interest for many biological problems or for, for many applied optics problems. Radiance is kind of one of the fundamental quantities. And one example here is that if we want to evaluate, say, the fluence at some location and time, uh, we just integrate the radiance values at the same position and time over all directions. And that gives us radiance, uh, it gives us fluence. And radiance is a kind of a, a physical quantity. It depend, generally depends on, of course, um, in, in the uh, light transport in tissue case, radiance inside the tissue gen or on the surface of the tissue generally depends on, of course, the tissue geometry, what is the shape or the size of the tissue, and optical properties, say how bright or how dark the, um, certain things are. Of course, as well as the source. If you move the source to a different location, of course, the distribution, the radiance field will change with it. So the rest of this lecture basically focuses on estimating the radiance field um, given, let's say, the, the, the geometry, the optical properties, as well as the source. Okay, so the radiance is unknown, but every, everything else is known. Okay. So to actually do that, um, we'll next talk about radiative transfer. So it's a physical model describing light propagation in translucent materials based on geometric optics. So translucent materials are basically any material that allow light to scatter within. So a few examples including, of course, uh, include human skin, of course, uh, and, but a lot else as well, um, a lot more as well, such as cloud, or milk, and in fact, strictly speaking, almost, uh, most materials are translucent. Uh, the real, so the other, the other extreme are opaque materials where light can only, say, bounce off of it. Um, but strictly speaking, only, can say, metal is mostly opaque. Everything else is more or less translucent. So that's why this um, radiative, the framework of radiative transfer has been used in many fields. Um, of course, in biomedicine, but also, let's say, remote sensing, astrophysics, a whole lot. And we also need to talk about geometric optics because this is a physical model of light. Um, as you all know, light is, a, is much more complicated um, than people originally thought. Um, there are even uh, so there are a, a hierarchy of um, of optical models. The geometric optics is kind of the simplest model. It describes light as rays, so it has a position and a direction. So 
In homogeneous media, basically or in vacuum, uh, it assumes light to travel in straight lines. Which, by the way, is not true if you know relativity and other stuff, right? But these are not basically ignored uh, in our case. And in addition, uh, geometric optics doesn't generally model wave effects such as diffraction and interference. So this model is only accurate when these effects are not prominent. Uh, fortunately, uh, in our applications, when we deal with relatively large-scale objects, that is the case. And now let's take a quick look at the stochastic model say, given by the, um, the radiative transfer framework. So under this framework, uh, light enters a material like human tissue and scattered around before eventually getting, well, eventually either leaves the volume or get absorbed and disappear, or get absorbed and transformed into heat. So when, say, we have a photon or particle travels inside, it might just get absorbed and disappear. Uh, it might hit, say, a particle. So the photon might hit the particle inside the, the, uh, the medium or the tissue and get absorbed. Um, at a collision, if, it's not, if the light is not absorbed, it's then scattered into a new direction. And then this process, this uh, going straight and collide, um, happens over and over again, and then we get a path that looks like this, or a path that terminates in between if light gets absorbed. Okay. So based on this uh, stochastic model, we have uh, at the at the core of the radiative transfer framework. We have the radiative transfer equation. Now, we might have seen this already uh, in previous lectures. Um, this governs the, uh, the radiance field L inside some volume V. And of course, this is a um, differential equation. So we need boundary conditions. Uh, so the boundary condition in practice is generally the radiance on the boundary, which we denote as the partial V. So V is the, uh, is the whole volume which is the union of the inside and the boundary. So this equation governs, pretty much governs the radiance field inside, and the boundary is, is considered as the boundary condition that should be given. And that's also related to a source. If you put source on the boundary, then that's part of your boundary condition. Um, but in today's lecture, let's look at a slightly simplified version of the radiative transfer equation, uh, which is the steady state version. So we assume radiance has reached steady state, which basically means it doesn't change over time anymore. So we can safely get rid of all time-related parameters and derivatives and get to a slightly simpler equation like this. Um, but other than that, it works exactly the same. It governs the radiance distribution inside a volume, and the boundary condition is the radiance on the boundary. So we don't have to, uh, you, you will see this equation many, many times, so um, you don't have to finish writing it now, writing it down now. Uh, so let, now let me give you a little bit more of intuition about what this equation actually says. Uh, this one uh, from high level, it basically says a relatively straightforward fact. So it says, well, on the left hand side we have differential radiance, so the, the change rate of radiance equals say the sum of three things. The first is in scattering. This, as I just mentioned, light can scatter within the medium. So if we look at um, the differential radiance at one particular position, with one particular direction, um, in scattering means light at the same position, but coming from other directions. This amount of light can get scattered into the current direction. And this in scattering has a, a, a positive contribution because we collect light from other directions that contributes to the current direction. We get more light, so that's positive. However, we have outscattering. We have light that originally follows the current direction, but gets scattered into other directions, as well as, of course, absorption. Light with the current direction can just get absorbed and disappear. So outscattering and absorption give negative contributions because it reduces the amount of radiance. And finally, we have the source term, which captures the emission. Um, in a lot of cases, 
we don't have, uh, uh, most materials, including human tissue, uh, don't have an, any emission. Um, in general, uh, in, in normal cases, unless you have some, uh, make it fluorescent or other things. Um, however, other materials like flame, they do have emission. So that's what the final Q term does. That's sometimes called the source term that captures the emission. But just for, um, to, to keep our derivation general, we all have the Q term here, here still. So here is just a slightly closer look at the individual terms. So here first we have the differential radius, which is just the sometimes called um, directional derivative. It's just the derivative of this radius field along a certain direction. As you can see, the derivative is defined as a limit. If you take the little step tau and make the step size to converge to zero, and that's kind of the definition of a derivative. And then in, in scattering, we have a scattering coefficient, uh, which normally changes um, spatially, but it's basically some positive number. And we have a phase function, P, that basically cap, uh, tells us if, at, uh, if a photon collide with a particle or with the material at some position R, with current dire direction omega prime, what is the probability density for the new direction, omega? So basically given r and omega prime, it's the probability density for the new direction, omega. And we have the, an extinction coefficient. Uh, it's again just um, a number, but that's uh, we should be no less than the scattering coefficient. And finally, we have the source term, which again is some non-negative function. Okay. So we'll see how these terms work uh, in later slides. So this is just a very quick overview. Okay. So uh, remember we have already seen Monte Carlo integration. So for actually applying that idea to this problem, so we have already seen the RTE, remember our focus is to solve for the radiance field, which basically means, oh yeah, here we basically means we assume everything other than the radiance is known, okay? So this becomes some, a differential equation or integral differential equation. Uh, however, since we already see Monte Carlo integration, that allows us to, well, numerically evaluate complex integrals. So it's desirable to rewrite this radiative transfer equation into an integral form. So instead of the uh, differential, uh, the integral differential form, uh, it's desirable to write it down as a, just an integral so that we can apply the Monte Carlo integration idea to it. So um, more precisely, it's des desirable to do it because the integration, the integral form uh, be is better suited for to the statistical model that we have already seen. And it's also much easier to solve numerically. And uh, since we don't have a lot of time, I'll omit the derivation. Uh, and you might not be interested in solving uh, a differential equation in the first place. So this is how the integral form looks like. Um, at any point r with direction omega, the amount of radiance L at r omega equals first a line integral. So the integral starts from r itself here and goes all the way back until hitting the boundary. So this R of partial V basically means if we go back from in direction minus omega, it will hit the boundary at R of uh, partial V. And so we, we evaluate a, we evaluate a um, Lie integral over this line. And at each point along the line, the R prime, we have another integral. That's basically, you have already seen, the in scattering part. We have to account for the light that enters uh, into R prime from other directions. So we, we have another integral here. And finally, we have to, uh, there's a transmittance term, which basically captures the fact that the light uh, entering R prime with direction 
omega will get attenuated along the way between r prime and r because of absorption and outscattering. So the transmittance basically captures the, the fraction of light that remains and is defined as an exponential function. Uh, and the integrand is, is the integrated version of the extinction coefficient. For now, we don't have to really care about all these details, but as long as we see um, mu t is given, so let's assume we know how to evaluate t already. The only thing that's unknown is L. And the second term basically captures the boundary condition. As I mentioned, we assume that L at the boundary is known. So here's the boundary condition term. Uh, and one detail here is that if the medium is infinite, um, this line can be infinitely long as well. So if this line never hits the boundary, it goes forever. Um, that is fine. Um, the only change in this equation is that the, circuit, the second term will vanish if this line goes forever. And this integral will be along an infinite line, which is fine. Because the transmittance will keep everything in check. We won't get infinite radiance out of it. So, okay, now, um, finally we are kind of ready to look at how we combine the idea of Monte Carlo integration and the integral form of the RTE to do light transport simulation. But before that, let's ta first take a look at general measurements, because in many, uh, it's not my problem, it's many problems, let's let me fix it. For many problem, many practical problems requires evaluating integrals, kind of integrated versions of the radians. As we have already seen in the example of um, fluence, if you have kind of an internal detector at some point inside the medium, then kind of a fluence meter kind of captures the integrated version, uh, the, the, the integrated version of radians at that particular point. So this can be kind of abstracted as kind of the, uh, the integration of kind of a measurement function and the radiance field. And another example is kind of a surface detector that captures irradiance, which basically means we have a detector located at some surface uh, area A on the boundary. And then we evaluate, say, all incoming radiance into that um, into that area with all directions. But all these different type of measurements can be captured using this single uh, form, which is a measurement function times the radius field. Now, since we already know Monte Carlo integration, we can just do it here for um, estimating these measurements. So what we can do, again, is to pick some density, P of R and um, omega, and then we get an unbiased estimator that, again, is F over P, it's just that here the integrand is the measurement function times radians, and then divided by this density. Again, you can pick a uniform distribution in cases like a fluence estimation, because the fluence is just an integration over all directions, so in that case, you can just pick one direction uniformly at random. Um, for the E-radiance case, you will need to pick one random position and random direction, but that's not very hard to do either. So either way, uh, you should be able to write down the density and to sample R and omega under that density uh, relatively easily. Okay? So, but here, in this estimator, we still have one term that's unknown, which is the radiance. So that's our focus as well. So next, we'll focus on estimating the radiance L. So if we can do that, then we are done, because we just, use, we just plug that in, and we'll be able to estimate any measurement in general. Okay. So, 
here is just a recap of the IRTE. Here, just for uh, simpler derivations, we now assume the medium is infinite because now we only have one term instead of two terms to deal with. And this single one, single uh, first term is also the, the key part because that's where uh, the, integra the, the integral is. Right, so here is just writing down that IRTE again. Uh, as I just mentioned, since we assume the medium is infinite, the, inter the, inter uh, the integral becomes from zero to infinity. So tau is basically only just the, the distance between r and r prime, right? So here, r prime is just r minus tau omega. So we are going back uh, with the distance of tau. Other than that, everything's the same. We have a transmittance term, we have an in scattering term, uh, and we have a emission term or a source term. So. Let's consider pro the problem of estimating L uh, R0, omega 0 for some given R0 and omega 0. As we have seen in the, in the previous slide, uh, in the general measurement slide, R0 and omega 0 can be given by sampling the, um, the detector, for example. So for now, let's just assume R0 and omega 0 is given. They are both given. We want to know the single radiance value. Okay. So, well, here is just the IRTE again um, with R and omega renamed as R0 omega 0, so nothing too fancy. Uh, but here, the important part is this. Since we have already know Monte Carlo integration is pretty much integrand over P, right? Here we have a very complicated integrand, but that's fine. We just rename it as f0 of tau. So this, this whole thing is a function of tau, right? So we just rename it as f of tau. Now, the IRTE basically becomes this, right? L of r0 omega 0 is an integral, uh, equals integral between 0 and infinity f0 of tau, some function. Now we apply the Monte Carlo integration idea by writing uh, that gives us an estimator of this particular radius value, which is just f over p. Let's for now assume we know what p is. Well, in theory, p can be anything, um, but I'll, I'll show you what p really is later. Uh, but as long as we have a p, we can, re we can apply the Monte Carlo integration idea and to get this l. Okay, any questions? Okay, however, the story doesn't end here yet, because if we look at what F0 is, remember F0 is just the integrand of this big thing. F In F0, it has another integral, right? So well, what we do, since in this estimator, we already picked a particular value of tau, right? So now we need to evaluate F0 of tau, now, we, to evaluate F0 of tau, we need to evaluate another integral. Well, we just apply the same Monte Carlo integration idea again. So, we eval instead of evaluating F0 exactly, well, we estimate it. Um, this boils down to sampling a random incident direction, omega 1. So again, F over P. So this one, let's assume we have again, a p omega 1 density. So this integral becomes, well, the integrand, which is phase function times L divided by this density p. Right. So now we can put everything together. Um, we get the an estimator of L at r0 omega 0 is basically we first pick a tau uh, based on the density p of tau. And then we pick a density um, for omega 1. So that's uh, what gives us this omega 1. OK? So finally, on the right hand side, we have another radiance, which is L at R1 and omega 1, which is this term, right? That's why our problem is so complicated, because it's an integral equation, it's not just a single integral. 
Well, but fortunately we can repeat the whole process again, just starting at R1 and omega 1. So, if we write down everything as a pseudocode, it's surprisingly simple. This is how it works. Uh, let's say we want to know the radians at some position r and, omega, and direction omega. We just draw tau from some PDF. We'll see how that works later. And then r1 is just r minus tau times omega along that line. And then we draw omega1 from some PDF again. And finally, we just return this whole thing, which is basically copying everything here. Uh, I think here should be just R, the typo here. It's so we just copy everything. Here we have an unknown L here. Well, we just call radius again. So it basically repeats this whole process over and over. So to give you a higher level picture, so the whole process will look like this. You start with R0 with some direction omega 0, right? Then you sample a position R1 somewhere back. And then you sample a new direction omega 1. And you start all over again. And then you follow this new direction omega 1 until you reach R2, etc. So this construction eventually gives you a photon path or biography that looks like R0 omega 0, R1 um, omega 1, etc. Uh, the construction we have seen here starts from R0 on the detector. Remember, R0 starts from the measurement function. It's kind of backwards, but it starts from the detector. Uh, there does exist another version that starts with the source. So we can go forward. Although, that uh, to show you how that works, we have to talk about adjoint operations, things like that. Um, so I'm not going to talk about that today. But just remember there is a kind of dual version, an adjoint version of this construction where you kind of simulate the real physical process and start from the source and it goes forward. But the two are exactly equivalent. So now let's start to look at um, how the two densities are. As I just mentioned, uh, in theory they can be anything but in practice, it's important to pick good ones. So here we first look at um, sampling incident directions, because that's easier. Normally what we do is to simply follow the phase function, because we know that phase function is already a probability density function. So in a lot of cases, um, we've, we basically pick p omega 1 equals the phase function. Uh, one thing to notice here is that originally the phase function is defined as a distribution of omega 0, not omega 1. Uh, however, in practice, a lot of times phase functions are, you know, sometimes people call it symmetric or um, has a reciprocity, which basically means you can interchange omega 0 and omega 1 and the phase function will be the same. Uh, so that's very common in practice. That's why we can safely write p of omega 0 as this. And uh, it still satisfies the fact, uh, the, the property that p is a, den the, a probability density. You have to make sure that p is indeed a probability density, which means it integrates to 1 and all, like non-negative and so on. Uh, in practice, this is normally the case. So if we can do that, then p of omega 1 nicely cancel out the phase function in the denominator. So the whole thing becomes much simpler. And this is also something people normally do. As I just mentioned, in theory this density can be anything, but in practice you normally want to cancel out certain terms in the integrand. Um, the benefit for doing so is that by canceling out terms, well, you get lower variance, right? In theory, if you can ca cancel out everything, then your estimator will have zero variance. But unfortunately, to cancel out everything, canceling out everything requires knowing the integral in the first place, because that's the, say, normalization factor of your density function. You cannot do that. But it's still desirable to cancel out as many terms as possible. So here, we just 
choose to cancel out the phase function term and resulting in a much simpler estimator. Now let's take a look at the remaining piece, which is the tau, the probability for tau. So again, we want to, the motivation is to cancel out certain terms. So here to sample the, uh, this tau is normally called free distance or free flight distance. This means the distance that a photon travels without colliding anything, so free of collision distance. So to sample this free of free flight distance, uh, it's desirable to cancel out the transmittance term. So we want to get rid of get rid of t here. In fact, um, this can be done by setting uh, p of tau to this new r1 times t of r1 to r0. Remember, r1 is a function of tau. So here, everything actually depends on tau. Uh, I'm not going to actually prove that this is a valid uh, distribution. Uh, so just believe me it is. So if you can do that, then this t goes away because, well, we have p tau is mu t times the transmittance. So it only leaves a mu t here. So the whole thing further reduces to this very simple term. Okay. So let me show you a simple example on how to draw tau. In homogeneous medium, um, we have mu t equals some constant everywhere. It's homogeneous basically means mu s, mu t, and p, they don't vary spatially. They are the same everywhere. So this thing basically becomes a a, um, has, has a simple form like this. It's mu t times uh, e to the power of minus mu t times tau. This is the probability density for the so-called exponential distribution. Now we can draw tau using the PDF sampling method that we just showed. It's a 1D distribution. Tau is just a number. So first we can get the CDF. Remember we need the cumulative distribution function as basically integral in this case, between 0 to tau, p is just here. Uh, and this one can be done analytically. And it's basically 1 minus uh, e to the power minus e to the times tau. So again, we just need the CDF inverse, right? So we just pick tau equals this, which is log 1. Oh, this is yeah, minus log 1 minus c divided by mu t. So here again, c is can be obtained using the rend, the standard rend function uh, that is pretty much uh, in all programming languages. And then you just evaluate the uh, usual logarithmic of 1 minus c divided by t. And then you get tau. So that's how to do it uh, for homogeneous cases. Uh, this can be done for heterogeneous cases as well. Um, but the, the, the sampling process will become quite a lot more complicated. Uh, and we won't talk about that today. Um, so finally, here is a note about stochastic model versus Monte Carlo. Here, due to the fact that we intentionally picked probability densities according to, say, the phase function and the transmittance terms, uh, our Monte Carlo process actually kind of simulates or mimics the real physical process. Uh, for example, when the light collides with a particle, it's, it gets to a new it gets scattered into a new direction according to the phase function, and we pick the phase function as the density. So, our particular this particular version of Monte Carlo solution and follows the statistical model. However, one thing to notice is that this is not the only solution, since again Monte Carlo integration allows the use of any probability density. So in certain cases, it might be more desirable to use other probability, other density functions. So you need to remember this. Although we conveniently picked probability densities that matches the, the stochastic model, this is by no means the only solution. Monte Carlo is much more general and much more powerful than that. OK. So finally, let's talk a little bit about uh, absorption weighting. Here, 
as we as we saw here, um, during the process, the construction of the photon biography from this R0, R1, etc., we are effectively um, decreasing the weight of the, of the photon because we multiply this mu s over mu t term every time before doing this thing all over again. Right? There is a mu s over mu t term. Um, remember, mu s should be always no greater than mu t. That's uh, required by the stochastic model. And a lot, of, a lot of times people refer to the ratio between these two, between the scattering coefficient and the extinction, the extinction coefficient as alpha or the single scattering albedo. So that is the, the amount of energy that a photon will, uh, will maintain at each scattering. So there are two ways uh, to interpret this, uh, this scaling factor, the scaling of albedo. You can either interpret this as the photon get absorbed with probability one minus alpha. This kind of fits the stochastic model better. The photon have a probability alpha to survive and a probability of one minus alpha to get absorbed and disappear. Um, there is another interpretation, which is the photon always survive, but its energy got so it gets down or scales down with a factor of alpha. Okay. So the two interpretations um, result in two slightly different implementations of um, the Monte Carlo process that we just showed. Again, um, we have showed a, gen a more general pseudocode earlier, but now uh, given the two particular probability densities, the, the estimator becomes much simpler. So the analog case is where we assume the photon get, say, disappears with a probability of um, one minus alpha. So here, if you look at the orange part, we only continue with a probability alpha or a probability mu s over mu t. So if ren less than that, well, the probability for a uniform 0, 1 variable to be smaller than something is basically that thing itself. So with, with probability uh, mu s over mu t, well, we continue. Otherwise, we stop. And the other interpretation is just we always continue, but we scale down the weight or the end photon energy with a factor of mu s over mu t. So this is the other, uh, the, the other way to implement the same thing. Uh, and we normally call this discrete uh, absorption weighting because this weight changes only at each collision, at each r. Um, there will be another way to do it, which is called uh, continuous absorption weighting, um, which corresponds to a similar thing, but using a different uh, density for a tau. Uh, and you will see in the following lecture. So if you go back and forth, you can see the, the two versions are very similar. It's just that uh, the, the discrete absorption weighting kind of scales down the, um, the photon weight or photon energy with, with a factor of albedo, and the other just kills the whole thing with a probability one minus. Uh, so, by comparing the performance of the two, we normally see that analog is faster because, of course, it kills the whole thing and don't have to simulate further collisions. However, um, discrete absorption weighting normally gives cleaner results. So, in practice, um, the real comparison that people normally make is sometimes called um, equal time comparison. You want to see with the same amount of computation which one gives you better result. Uh, but that normally depends on your problem. There is no simple answer to which one to use. Okay. And uh, Monte Carlo, uh, as I just mentioned, is a very powerful tool. So it's not, we have seen how Monte Carlo can be used to simulate 
um, like transporting tissue and to um, estimate uh, general measurements, measurements of radians. A Monte Carlo can also be used to solve inverse problems, which are particularly say, important for biomedical problems. So the, the inverse problems are looks like this. In this case, the measurement is given. And we want to solve for the material properties, like mu t, the, the extinction and scattering coefficient, as well as the phase function. Uh, this is important for biomedical applications because, well, if you want to make some diagnosis, you want to guess what's going on, say, inside um, human tissue or underneath the skin. If you want to make any kind of non-invasive diagnosis, this is the kind of problem that you want to solve. You know the measurement because you can say, pick a point a laser at the skin and then take a picture. That pretty much gives you eye already. Um, but in this case, you don't know the, say, the skin properties or the tissue properties. And these are the unknowns. So this is normally called the inverse problem because the knowns and unknowns are kind of flipped. Um, however, the inverse problem, unfortunately, is generally much more difficult since well, you have to guess what's inside, right? You cannot see them directly. So in this case, the inverse problem is generally modeled as an optimization. So um, we optimize for the material properties so that the difference between I0, which is the, the real measurement, which you get by taking a picture or something, between this real measurement and a simulated measurement using the parameters, is minimized. So we want to pick a set of parameters so that the real measurement and the simulated measurements are as close as possible. So this is normally how people uh, formulate the inverse problem. As you can see here, solving the inverse problem requires a forward solver. This also, this also explains why the forward simulation is so important, because you need it even for the inverse problems. So here, of course, this is a general framework. There are several things that um, still need to be determined. For example, we need to determine the norm. So how, should, how to specify the difference between two measurements. Um, common examples include standard, say, L2 metrics, um, but it could be other things. And also, we will see in the next lecture, uh, to actually solve the optimization, we sometimes need, for example, um, to evaluate the gradient of the, the, the gradient of so the change rate of I uh, with respect to certain material parameters like mu s and mu t. Because if you want to carry out gradient descent or any kind of general purpose optimization algorithm, that's needed. So the forward simulation has to be slightly modified to provide not only the measurement value but also certain derivatives or certain gradients of the measurement with respect to certain material parameters. But that can be done. Okay, yeah, so that's pretty much it for the main technical content. Uh, in the very end, I just want to show you that Monte Carlo integrations is also used, integration is also used to render photorealistic images. For example, something like this, uh, we have a colored explosion here, the explosion itself is a translucent material. So radiative transport is used here. Uh, so how this image is, is uh, generated basically involves estimating the radiance value point. So there's a virtual camera, a virtual sensor, virtual detector pointing towards this uh, colored cloud. And one will need to evaluate the radiance from everywhere in the cloud pointing towards the camera. So based on these radiance values, well, we are able to gen generate an image like this. So the underlying, the underlying um, Monte Carlo process is exactly the same. And here's another uh, image. Again, this is computer simulated. It's, there's no photo behind this. It's purely virtual. Um, here, this is another project that I did a few years ago where we measured, well, we solved the inverse problem uh, for several simple materials. These are all much simpler than human tissue. They're all homogeneous. 
Uh, but in the end, we can reproduce their appearances quite accurately, again, by solving the radiative transfer problem within these materials. Okay, finally, there are some take home message. Um, you know, we have seen that radiative transfer is an accurate model for light propagation of uh, translucent materials when wave, wave effects are not prominent. And Monte Carlo methods, Monte Carlo solution to the RTE provides a gold standard for simulating light transport in tissue. And finally, the flexibility. Remember, you can pick any density function. That's the power of Monte Carlo. Um, allows future research toward more efficient estimators. Yeah, and that's it for this lecture. Thank you. Yeah. Any question? Yes, yeah. So um, you were considering an infinite medium, right? So there were no boundary conditions at all. And you said that there was a transmittance term that was helping it, keeping it finite. Um, right. So the transmittance term, yes, let me show you. Uh, where is the original? So yeah, yeah. Uh, the transmittance term ensures that this integral will be finite, even if it's infinite. Have an infinite medium basically get rid of this term. Yes. So there's no this. Uh, so here, the transmittance, as you can see, the transmittance term is exponent a minus integral. So the transmittance goes down very quickly. Okay. There's okay. an exponential decay. So if uh, you go as you go further from R, the no matter how high this part is, it's going to be scaled down by the transmitter. So that's, that guarantees the convergence. Okay, and um, all throughout the radiance does not have the time dependence because we're considering steady state, right? Yeah. Yeah. You can apply the, the same idea to the general uh, With the case. time. Yeah, but well. here we assume it's steady state, okay. so yeah, the time the variable is uh, omitted here. All right, and also in the uh, radiative transfer equation, the Q term, that's the source term. Mm -hmm. So I have a doubt about that, that. So you're considering a point at one time, and when you're considering the Q term, is it the light that is carried on from the source now at that point, or is it just the case of an autofluorescence in addition? Can you say it again? So um, when you're considering a point, and the Q term in the radiative transport equation, would it be uh, non-zero only if there's some radiation coming from that point? Like Oh, you mean a point source? Yeah. Yes. So, yeah, it's a good question. It's a very good question. Um, this formulation that I just showed will have difficulties if you have a source that's only at a single point, okay. right? Because if we look at... Um, yeah, it's, it's a really good question. If we look at our process, um, let's say, yeah, this one. We only accumulate the source at the collisions that we generate, right? If there's only a single point where the source is now zero, this will give us zero 100% of the time, and that's not good. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, there are methods that can uh, solve this problem. The first one, as I just mentioned, there's another way to do it by starting from the source. So we can right. do that. Walking from the source. Right now we are walking yeah. in the back. This one, this one we are kind of starting from a detector and going yes. back. You can do the other way. Okay. Um, or there is another, there's an important technique called next event estimation. I don't have enough time to talk about that. Mm -hmm. um, it is possible to kind of, um, to greatly increase the support of the source uh, so that it's non-zero everywhere, or mostly everywhere, or at least at some non-zero volume. So here, if the source is just a point, it's at a, it's a zero measure subset. Mm -hmm. That's not good. But there's, there's, there are techniques that can extend that to a much uh, bigger support.
Yeah, but it is a limitation of this particular method. Yeah, so that's a good question. All right, thank you.